Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. May the Holy Spirit, the Father of the poor, enlighten our minds and our hearts, and lead us to the fullness of the truth. St. John, pray for, pray for us. us. Our Lady of Sorrows, pray, pray for, for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Um, okay, so I, I'm just going to kind of regurgitate a little bit of what we've already looked at. And again, if you have any questions, and I, I guess there's people listening. Um, I don't know if I made this announcement last time, but if there's any way to, you know, ask a question online, I'm not sure what that is. Um, comments or something? Yeah, comments. Um, I guess Father Nathan, he has access to certain things, so. Father Francis, um, do you see it? Yeah, that would be great to, to have a little feedback. Um, so, this is theology, um, and the, the intention for this class is to uh, enter into a relationship with God. Um, and so we're, we're going to be looking at things from an explicitly Christian viewpoint. But like I had mentioned before, I, I would like to put certain things in parallel with you know, the, the human uh, viewpoint. Um, so we have, you know, reality, and that includes the totality of everything that exists. Um, we can and should have a, a great desire to know what is real. And when what we know corresponds to what is, then we have the truth, right? That's from St. Thomas. Um, when what we have inside of us corresponds to what exists then that's true. That's true. Um, but there's degrees of truth. So there is. There's like scientific truth. There's artistic truth. Um, there is a certain subjective truth. Legitimate subjectivity. In French they say, Les couleurs et les gouttes, on ne discute pas. Color and taste we don't argue about, mm -hmm. right? There's a legitimate, I can't say, Brie, what's your favorite color? Do you want me to answer? Yes. Blue. Blue. I just uh, like it. But it's not the best color. <laughs> Green's the best color. <laughs> it's a matter of opinion. Yeah. yeah. You could say that. But and what's your favorite true. food? G in general. Pizza. Pizza, <laughs> let's, say, let's say Italian. Thai food is so much better than Italian food. I don't necessarily believe those things. Playing the devil's advocate. But you get the idea. Mm -hmm. For things like that, that is legitimately within the realm of opinion or a subjective truth that's tied to an individual. And <laughs> you can't argue, you know, the contrary of that. Um, yeah, that is opinion. So... The problem becomes, um, the problem is, uh, that becomes a problem when everything is relegated to the realm of opinion. That's your opinion, you know? Well, no, it's not just my opinion. If you mean by opinion, that's what I think. Okay, fair enough. But if you mean by opinion, this is what I prefer, like my favorite food or my favorite color, then I have to disagree with you. There's some objective element that goes beyond just my personal preference in this or that case. Um, usually people will only allow science to, to maintain that type of objectivity. Usually. No. More and more, we, we see a society where it's the scientific, the provable, you know... Um, that 
is worthy of being given that type of honor of objective truth. Um, and even there to a certain extent, because science is completely or is, you know, constantly evolving. Um, certain theories are being replaced with certain new theories. So degrees of knowledge, um, scientific, artistic, there is opinion. Um, but now there is objectivity. The table exists. Uh, I think I might have mentioned the first class. I don't know if you were here. I don't know if I mentioned it, but I was in a pub in Cleveland, Ohio, sitting around with some with a friend and some of his friends who I just met for the first time. And one of them, um, after finding out that I had studied philosophy, um, and he knew I was a Christian too, so I think that was in the mix. But he, he looked at me, he smiled, and he said, the table doesn't exist. I'm like, what do you mean the table doesn't exist? <laughs> I said, why would you doubt that? And he goes, no, you're the one who uses the word doubt and applies it to me. I'm affirming that the table doesn't exist. And he goes through this scientific explanation, which basically goes further and further into the minute composition of the table until you end up with forces that have no um, discernible physical locality and substance, right? So it's very interesting. He looks at that through a, a scientific prism, but he sat his beer down on the table that didn't exist. He sat his sandwich down on the table that didn't exist. There we see that there is a type of interaction with reality where it's immediate, it's... It's uh, an immediate contact. You're not going through any kind of a filter, right? We talked about a priori's. He was using an a priori of a scientific perspective through which he was viewing the physical world around him. Whether or not he really believed that, I don't, I don't know. Like I said, practically speaking, um, if he did believe things like that, he shouldn't be driving. Um, and there's probably a lot of other things. That would go into that, you know. That's with respect to physical reality. But now there's an objectivity to reality that transcends the physical. So, question of soul, for example. Do you have a soul, Vince? I hope so. Huh? <laughs> I hope so. Okay. Is it dependent upon your hope? <laughs> Very clever, Vince. <laughs> well, if you do, then it probably doesn't depend on your hope. But what does it depend on? How can you know that? Because it makes you feel good thinking that you have a soul? That's the criticism that, you know, certain people will, will raise. And this is, this is prior to even talking about things of the you know, supernatural realm. Things like God is Trinity or Jesus is God, right? We're talking about things that we believe can be accessed by our humanity, our human capacities. We don't need the gift of faith to come to those um, realizations that there is a spiritual principle in you and in myself. Now, your Christian faith will tell you, yeah, Vince, you've got a soul. So it's done and dusted, right? Don't, need, don't even have to bother with uh, trying to figure out how am I supposed to come to the realization that there's a soul? Well, my faith tells me. So it's done, right? I think logically. Huh? Like, I think logically it makes sense that you would think that you have a soul because it gives you purpose. Well, that's the problem. That's, that is exactly the problem. Logically, yeah. depending on where you're starting from, it can fit into your system. Yeah. But do you remember what we kind of ended on last time? People will say that you are it starting exist. from a, a, a point of view 
where it's already included in the point of view. Yeah. So you don't ever have to discover anything. You logically um, connect it mm -hmm. in your mind. But I'm telling you, Vince, that's the only place that it exists in your mind, yeah. in your logical system. Do you have an experience of... Do you have, yeah, have you experienced somebody's soul here? No. Tell us about it. <laughs> so I, again, I'm playing the devil's advocate Amazing. for those who might be listening. <laughs> um, I believe that we have a soul. Um, I believe that we are capable of discovering, again, a spiritual principle which is objective, it's not just at the level of opinion. It's not just at the level of logic, right? But it's um, something that can be discovered within our experience and questioning and trying to go further, right? And the reason why we should do that, even if our faith tells us already that we have a soul, is because we become more human. We're, we're made to penetrate into reality. That's what intelligence really is. It's going as far as possible into the objectivity of reality in such a way that we discover things that are beyond just the physical world. And that is difficult. It's always been rigorous. Now, now, people can believe that, and they can believe that in a way that's, that's sane and healthy because of the culture that's around them that supports that. And it's true, and they trust, right? They don't go through these steps where their, their intelligence is engaged in a, a philosophical kind of evaluation. We don't live in that kind of society. You know? And at least for that reason... For more than that reason, but at least for that reason, it's so important for us to have our a desire to know the truth in such a way that we can, we will at least want to discover these things, right? Um, because if we don't, then the things of the faith, again, they're going to be lived at an emotional level or at this level of logic. And it can't just be that. It's like it has to be inexperience it has to be inexperience so we want to go as far as possible in human experience so that the divine experience will have um, as few obstacles as possible does that make sense and there again I talked about some of the obstacles you know these ideologies that we have um, and there's reasons that we might have those. It could be our own pride. It could be because we've been hurt, right? So the scandal of evil. And that's something that I want to, um, to really look at today. So the, the, the point is entering into a relationship with God. I said we we're going to loosely kind of follow the pattern of the, the catechism. I believe in God. The Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. For a lot of people, this question is becoming um, more and more difficult to believe that there is a God. Now, some of that's not new. You, you have, in, you know, very few instances, but... Um, in antiquity, those who have questioned, you know, if there were gods or a god. Um, more recently, you have an increase in, uh, in those who question, and not only question, but um, who positively state there is no god. You know, atheists, atheism. Um, and it's good for us to have a sense of why people would be scandalized why people might have these impediments because 
you know, the, the reason for your being here is to definitely to deepen your faith. That's the most important thing. But then you're going to have to share that faith. And you can't just be sharing information that you've memorized. The, these are things that you have to discover. Nobody else can discover it for you. You can be supported by the community that you're in. You, you can trust. You know, I, I trust those who are around me. They believe this. Um, I know that they're, for the most part, they seem to be good people. Um, that helps, you know. But ultimately, it has to be your relationship with God um, that you share with others. And again, there's going to be different ways that you do that. You don't just say, you know, guess what came to me in prayer today? Or can I tell you about this verse? Maybe, maybe, but, you know, that'll turn a lot of people off. Um, sometimes the Holy Spirit might want you to do something that seems kind of stupid like that, you know? To, to as a friend of mine would say, to step out in boldness. And he would. And he, he would do some embarrassing things sometimes. And sometimes he would just fall flat on his face. Like he would go up to somebody and say, you know, I think that maybe um, God wants me to say this. And, you know, the person would just respond, that, that is, has no pertinence to anything that I'm living he told me about a situation like that in a restaurant. But there have more often than not been a, a reaction of amazement on the, the part of the person, you know. And he, he said, you know, one of two things is going to happen. Um, either I'm going to be humbled so I can grow in humility, or it's going to be for God's glory, and His glory will, you know, shine forth. So, anyway... The other part is evangelization. So we want to know where people are coming from. And to be able to make a discernment. Okay, is this person who's spouting off about the Catholic Church and uh, about the, you know, the, the myth of God, is it because of a pain that's inside of them? Or is it because of like a, a pride and arrogance? Usually it's a mixture of both. But in order to really, you know, walk with people in a way that's intelligent, um, we need to know that side of things too. So, um, I would like to to share certain things that evoke the scandal of evil. Right. Um, the one is going to be a passage from the Brothers Karamazov, Dostoevsky. Um, conversation between two of the brothers, Ivan and Alyosha. Alyosha has just left the monastery um, for different reasons. His, uh, what would you say, the, his, the priest, the father, who was his mentor, has just passed away, and he's taking some, some time for different reasons outside of the monastery. His brother Ivan, an older brother, um, is is an avowed atheist, and so they are. Uh, they've come together, and Ivan is presenting his case to Alyosha, who everybody recognizes that Alyosha is a very good person, even his brother here, right? But there's there's something that he wants. Alyosha to understand that he doesn't believe he um, he does, and and a lot of it he, he wants Alyosha to understand him too, and um, why he thinks as he does. So this is Ivan who is going on a very intense, I would say at a certain level, an intelligent rant that you will hear echoed today in different people. One of them, we'll, we'll see a little bit from uh, Christopher Hitchens, who just died a couple of years ago, but who I think is probably one of the more powerful presenters of the scandal of evil. He said he himself was a, an atheist, but 
all of them, um, I think, in one way or another, uh, find kind of a root in the soil of Dostoevsky. Um, if not explicitly, then, you know, of the same spirit. But I'm, I'm sure that he, he was familiar with Dostoevsky. Anyway, Ivan has just told Alyosha of two particular cases where children were tortured by those that were close to them. And it seems that Dostoevsky was um, citing certain things that were, you know, real in, in the Russia of his day. So he, taught, he told uh, Alyosha about a little girl who was abused by the, the parents and um, a little boy who was part of a family of serfs who had thrown a rock, hit the paw of um, the master's prize hound and um, the master had him torn apart by the pack of dogs in front of his mother. So he's just told Alyosha these things and now he's giving this kind of epic rant. I understand nothing, Ivan went on, as though in delirium. I don't want to understand anything now. I want to stick to the fact. I made up my mind long ago not to understand. If I try to understand anything, I shall be false to the fact, and I have determined to stick to the fact. Why are you trying me? Alyosha cried with sudden distress. Will you say what you mean at last? Of course I will. That's what I've been leading up to. You are dear to me. I don't want to let you go. And I won't give you up to your Zosima. That was his, the priest mentor. <clears throat> Ivan for a minute was silent. His face became all at once very sad. Listen, I took the case of children only to make my case clear. Of the others, other tears of humanity with which the earth is soaked from its crust to its center, I will say nothing. I have narrowed my subject on purpose. I am a bug, and I recognize in all humanity that I cannot understand why the world is arranged as it is. Men are themselves to blame, I suppose. They were given paradise, they wanted freedom, and stole fire from heaven, though they knew they would become unhappy. So there is no need to pity them, with my pitiful earthly Euclidean understanding, all I know is that there is suffering and that there are none guilty, that cause follows effect simply and directly, that everything flows and finds its level. It's kind of a scientific worldview here. But that's only Euclidean nonsense. I know that, and I can't consent to live with it. What comfort is it to me that there are none guilty, and that cause follows effect simply and directly, and that I know it. I must have justice, or I will destroy myself. And not justice in some remote, infinite time and space, but here, on earth, and that I could see myself. I've believed in it, I want to see it, and if I am dead by then, then let me rise again, for if it all happens without me, it will be too unfair. Surely I haven't suffered simply that I... My crimes and my sufferings may manure the soil of the future harmony for somebody else. I want to see with my own eyes the hind lie down with the lion and the victim rise up and embrace its murderer. I want to be there when everyone suddenly understands what it has all been for. All the religions of the world are built on this longing, and I am a believer. But then there are the children, and what am I to do about them? That's a question I can't answer. For the hundredth time, I repeat, there are numbers of questions, but I've only taken the children, because in their case, what I mean is so unanswerably clear. Listen, if all I must suffer to pay for the eternal harmony, what have children to do with it? Tell me, please. It's beyond all comprehension why they should suffer and why they should pay for the harmony. Why should they, too, furnish material to enrich the soil for the harmony of the future? I understand solidarity in sin among men. I understand solidarity in retribution, too. But there can be no such solidarity with children. 
And if it really is true that they must share responsibility for all their father's crimes, such a truth is not of this world and is beyond my comprehension. Some jester will say, perhaps that the child would have grown up and have sinned. But you see, he didn't grow up. He was torn to pieces by the dogs at eight years old. Oh, Alyosha, I'm not blaspheming. I understand, of course, what an upheaval of the universe it will be when everything in heaven and on earth blends in one hymn of praise and everything that lives and has lived cries aloud, Thou art just, O Lord, for thy ways are, are revealed. When the mother embraces the fiend who threw her child to the dogs, and all three cry aloud with tears, Thou art just, O Lord. Then, of course, the crown of knowledge will be reached and all will be made clear. But what pulls me up here is that I can't accept that harmony. And while I am on earth, I make haste to take my own measures. You see, Alyosha, perhaps it may really happen that if I live to that moment or rise again to see it, I too perhaps may cry aloud with the rest, looking at the mother embracing the child's torture. Thou art just, O Lord. But I don't want to cry aloud then. While there is still time, I hasten to protect myself, and so I renounce the higher harmony altogether. It's not worth the tears of that one tortured child who beat itself on the breast with its little fist and prayed in its stinking outhouse with its unexpiated tears to dear, kind God. It's not worth it, because those tears are unatoned for. They must be atoned for, or there can be no harmony. But how? How are you going to atone for them? Is it possible? By their being avenged? But what do I care for avenging them? What do I care for a hell for oppressors? What good can hell do, since those children have already been tortured? And what becomes of harmony, if there is a hell? I want to forgive. I want to embrace. I don't want more suffering. And if the sufferings of children go to swell the sum of sufferings which was necessary to pay for truth, then I protest that the truth is not worth such a price. I don't want the mother to embrace the oppressor who threw her son to the dogs. She dare not forgive him. Let her forgive him for herself, if she will. Let her forgive the torture for the immeasurable suffering of her mother's heart. But the sufferings of her tortured child, she has no right to forgive. She dare not forgive the torture, even if the child were to forgive him. And if that is so, if they dare not forgive, what becomes of harmony? If there in the whole world a being, is there a whole in the whole world a being who would have the right to forgive and could forgive? I don't want harmony. For love of humanity, I don't want it. I would rather be left with the unavenged suffering. I would rather remain with my unavenged suffering and unsatisfied indignation, even if I were wrong. Besides, too high a price has asked for harmony. It's beyond our means to pay so much to enter it. And so I hasten to give back my entrance ticket. And if I am an honest man, I am bound to give it back as soon as possible. And that I am doing. It's not God that I don't accept Alyosha. Only, I most respectfully return him the ticket. That's rebellion, murmured Alyosha, looking down. So, Ivan, he has, uh, he has a point, that at least the way he presents it. If, in order to achieve this euphoric state, heaven, which is what the Christians kind of long for, to be in the presence of God and one another, the communion of saints, and eternal bliss, if a prerequisite for that is suffering, especially the suffering of children, 
who in no way merited that, then he's saying, um, it's yeah, not worth it. I don't accept that. I reject it. And what I'm trying to do right now is to so enroot myself in this indignation that when everything is revealed and it says that all creation is going to say, oh, it all makes sense now, in a paraphrase, I want me to be able to resist that. So if we could look, it's just a, a few minute video. This is uh, more of a kind of a contemporary presentation by Christopher Hitchens based on this one case that I'm sure you're, you're probably familiar with from a couple of years ago. Okay, can you guys see? A crime that shocked Austria and the world. 73-year-old Josef Fritzl will go on trial for locking up his daughter Elizabeth for 24 years, fathering seven children with her. Fritzl's apartment block here in Ipp Street in the small town of Amstetten hid a dark secret. This was the entrance to the windowless soundproof cellar complex Fritzl built under the house. In 1984, he lured Elizabeth down to the cellar. Three of the children she gave birth to underground were allowed to live with Fritzl and his wife in the upstairs house. They led normal lives and went to this local school. Three other children grew up in the cellar with their mother and one other child died shortly after birth. Fritzl will be tried here at the regional court in St. Pölten for murder and five other offences, including enslavement, incest and rape. This is Christopher Hitchens commenting on this. Freisel in Austria, whose father, unwilling to get out of the way, kept her in a dungeon where she didn't see daylight for 24 years and came down most nights to rape and stop myself in front of the children who were the victims of the previous tax offences. And it's only purely by accident that uh, Herr Freisel is now in custody. And it's a shame that he's 76 because his life in prison isn't going to feel enough like that to him. I want you to just think, take a moment, since we're so interested in the downtrodden and the helpless. Imagine how she must have begged him. Imagine how she must have pleaded. Imagine for how long. Imagine how she must have prayed every day, how she must have besieged him. Imagine for 24 years and no, no answer at all. Nothing. Nothing. Imagine how those children must have felt. Imagine what, what they felt when they saw one of them, one of their number, the dead twin, being borne away from neglect on top of everything else. Now, you say that's all right that she went through that because she'll get a better deal in another life. Are you? I have to ask you if you, if you can be morally or ethically serious and postulate such a question. No, that had to happen. And heaven did watch it with indifference because it knows that that score will later on be settled. So it was well worth the going through it. She'll have a better time next time. I don't see how you can look anyone, anyone in the face, or live with yourself and say anything so hideously, wickedly immoral as that, or even imply it. There, that's my answer. So he's very adept at, um, you know, a rhetorical presentation that does have its its root in this um, very serious um, existential situation of being scandalized at evil in the world. Um, and he, he, he made something of a caricature, but actually most people would probably, most Christians would probably respond along the lines of, uh, of what he presented as the Christian position. Same as Ivan. It, it'll all work out for the glory of God. And that person will be so much happier, you know, in the next life. But I, I think that we, at least, you know, myself, I know that for myself, um, I definitely... Empathize. It resonates with me the scandal of evil, um, and especially with those who are innocent. And so, as Saint Thomas says, this is the the greatest stumbling block to discovering the existence of God. And that's as a human being. The 
problem with the evil. Why didn't God respond? Why doesn't God respond? I can and I will have some responses that it doesn't take away this the scandal. Like I mentioned yesterday at Augustine Institute, um, the the only way to get out of it is love. Intellectually, if you try, you'll end up saying something that is either you know inadequate. If you try to resolve it, or very dumb, you know, and, and painful, you, you will augment the pain. And you could see, again, how he kind of played on that the Christian um, who's just trying to make it all work out simply, you know. Um, I would suggest for us. Now, having evoked this, uh, I think that it would be normal to have a, a certain emotion of indignation, you know. Um, but they can't throw us into a tailspin, you know. And it's kind of like what uh, the the question of of Descartes' method was, you know. He wanted to start with doubt, and then from there. Reach the existence of God, because first he affirmed that I think, therefore I am. Work to the existence of God, and then to the existence of other things. And um, that doesn't work. If you start with doubt, you can't get out. Right? And it's the same thing with this. If this is your starting point, um, the prism through which you view God then at a certain level, you won't get out. You're in, in an intellectual space where the scandal of evil will remain. And so you will remain in that if that's your starting point. What is our starting point? That um, because evil exists in the world, either God is not all good, or he's not all powerful. You know, that's kind of like the the logical or the what follows a lot of times if you stay in an intellectual kind of reasoning of this. Um, so our vantage point is um, again in our human experience to go through wonder, we don't dismiss the reality of, of these evils that exist in the world, but if we're truly awake and alive, we will be polarized still, even if we're in the midst of something terrible, we can still be polarized by this attraction to truth, right? And that has to be the most primordial kind of force in us. Again, we don't dismiss the evil. Um, and that will lead us to the discovery that, that there is a God that, um, that the, he is bound up in, in some way with love and truth. Right? Um, but the, that's an ultimate kind of discovery for your intelligence. We, we accept that, but it's another thing to actually really go through all of the things that lead there. But, but one of them is definitely a discovery of the soul, right? If, if we don't come to the realization that there's a spiritual principle in those persons that we experience around us, there's no way that we're going to be able to do it with respect to some type of a transcend, transcendent, eternal being. No, it passes through discovery at a more immediate level, but one that equally goes beyond material you know, the material level. Um, but now, what about as believers? As believers, we're still human beings. The scandal's still there. Right? 
Um, here I would like to share with you two things. This is the soul part of a class that I did recently. So, um, I think that these two things, at least for me, they, they, again, they don't answer everything, but they can help. So, there was a, a woman who was speaking to uh, university students. She was a survivor of the Holocaust. She was Jewish. She had a tattoo on her arm, I believe. You know, the number that was, she was given. It's part of the process of dehumanization that the Nazis did. No one had a name. Um, they were just a number. And um, after she had presented, you know, the what she had experienced of the Holocaust, uh, I heard that a, a young woman stood up and she asked the survivor where was God in all of that? And the woman um, responded to the young woman, I have a question for you. Where was humanity in all of that? So, that's that's one thing, again, it doesn't resolve all the riddle there, but to immediately attribute everything to God, you know, doesn't really do justice to the experience of um, seeing evil come through this or that person, individual, or these people as a group, right? So we want to to be very realistic in locating, you know, what is the immediate source of evil. Again, it doesn't resolve this riddle of, okay, why doesn't God intervene? If he's all good and he's all powerful, why doesn't God intervene? So another story um, that I'd heard, there's a, a man who was in a, a, one of the prison camps, um, and he was talking about some of the atrocities that he would witness, you know, and um, he spoke of this experience of watching uh, a group of prisoners uh, being hung. And, um, you know, the, the, they would be hung or they would be killed for different reasons, you know, one of which would be um, if somebody else tried to escape people back in the prison camp would die for it. So it was one of the uh, potential deterrents to keep people from, from trying to escape the camp. They would say, realize that for, if you make it, um, then there will be so many people back here who die because of you. So anyway, he was watching one man being hung and he had the same question as the young woman. Where is God in all of this? And he said as he watched this, um, it was like a voice inside of him that responded, God is in the man. So, here again, this doesn't make everything fine and all right, but it speaks of the, the mystery in a way where we see that God is not um, distant. He, he's not l just looking down as on an ant farm, you know, watching all of this take place from his nice, cozy, heavenly armchair, you know, that, that he is suffering in humanity. Now you can still make a caricature of that and say, what a sadistic God, for example. Right? But within the experience of love, and with a starting point, that God is love, and that God is innocent, right? Then, even though we can't explain everything, there's still something there that is... Um, It doesn't evacuate hope. There's still a dynamic of rejuvenation. 
I still don't know why.